about ladies and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes and whether you're logging on to Torah anytime or to ohelsara.com as you know I am so excited and so impressed by your devotion and your dedication to Torah study to your neshama to your souls to the elevation of it I am here today in Haifa where my Rebbitzin has a three-night retreat for ladies in order to rejuvenate oneself spiritually. So I'm sorry that this uh, lecture is coming up only on Monday afternoon by you. It's going to be Monday afternoon and not our usual Sunday schedule. But uh, we were busy with a bunch of different things here, so please forgive me for that. I also want to dedicate this shiur to, like we said, to the, the young man who unfortunately passed away suddenly, to Simantov Moshe Ben Tamara, Alava Shalom. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should grant his family a nechama. And uh, as a result of whatever we learn here today, he should have an aliyat nechama. And um, you have a schut in that, in that anything you take upon yourself from whatever we're going to learn here today, it's a schut for you that in your merit, the neshama ascends to very elevated places in the heavens. This week's parasha in Eretz Yisrael is Korach. Now, what Korach did was bold and a huge chutzpah. He gathered a few followers who were like-minded, together with 250 members of Sanhedrin, and he waged a rebellion against the leader of Am Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu, alav shalom. Korach was plagued with the Yetzirah of power. He wanted the position of leadership and he felt that it was his right. And interestingly, Moshe's re reaction is different than all the other disasters in Am Yisrael that took place before and after this rebellion. Now if you remember last week, was the story of the Meraglim, the spies. That too was such a terrible story that a Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to eradicate the entire nation because of it. Moshe Rabbeinu had to invoke HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Midot of Rachamim in order to persuade him to be more lenient with the people. The same was true concerning the sin of the golden calf, Chetah Egel. There too Moshe prayed on behalf of the Jewish people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should not destroy them. So we see that Moshe Rabbeinu was always coming forward on behalf of Am Yisrael and defending them even when they committed the worst crimes. Moshe Rabbeinu was very patient with the people and he tolerated their indiscretions throughout his career as a leader. But when it came to Korach, it was the exact opposite. We don't see that he prayed for Korach or his followers. He doesn't appeal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to forgive them or to have mercy on them. He doesn't ask Hashem to provide them with clarity or that uh, Hashem shine his light upon them. And not only doesn't he pray for them, not only doesn't he pray that this dilemma should go away, but he actually davens for Korach's demise. He asks Hashem, to destroy Korach and all those who were involved in this horrible story and he asks that it should be done not in a normal fashion. Moshe Rabbeinu actually chose the kind of death that they should experience in order for them to understand the gravity of what they did. He asked God to open the ground so that the ground should swallow up Korach v'chol adato. This was a, a very unique situation because we never saw such a circumstance in the Midbar where Moshe Rabbeinu not only doesn't defend the antagonist, he actually prays for his death. This was unlike Moshe's essence, especially since the people previously sinned quite grievously 
with the sin of the golden calf, as we mentioned. In that case, over there, it was a clear sin of Avodah Zarah, and yet Moshe Rabbeinu went out of his way to save Bnei Israel. But in this case over here, he does not defend Korach or his followers. He doesn't appeal to Hashem on behalf of those 250 members of Sanhedrin. He does the opposite. He asks Hashem to do away with them. So this story needs clarification. What really happened here? Rabbeinu Bachya Alav Shalom offers us the key that opens the door to understand this story. He comments on the Pasuk in this parasha where Moshe Rabbeinu tells the people the following. Im kemot kol ha'adam yemutun elu If these men die as all men die, ufkudat kol ha'adam yipaked alehem and the fate of all men be visited upon them, lo Hashem shalachani then God has not sent me. Says Rabbeinu Bachya on these words of Im kemot kol ha'adam If Korach and his followers are going to die as all men die Listen to the words of Rabbeinu Bachya Aval yesh lishol velitmoa Tema gadol be'inyan parashat zot Al shnei devarim There are two huge aspects of this story that need clarification Ha'echad, first of all Moshe, shehaya ro'e ne'eman. Moshe was a very loyal shepherd of Am Yisrael. Shehitpalel al Yisrael kama pe'amim al kama averot she'asu. He prayed on behalf of the people quite a number of times concerning grave sins that they engaged in. Ke'inyan ma'ase ha'egen, like the incident of the golden calf. Ve'chet ha'meraglim and the sin of the spies when they spoke disparagingly about Eretz Yisrael. Ech lo hitpalel alehem bekan. How is it that in this case he didn't daven for them? And if you're thinking, by the way, well, you know, this case was different because it was personal. What do you mean personal? Moshe was anav mikol adam asher al pneha adama. He was the humblest of all men. Do we assume that because the sin of the golden calf was a sin that took place between the people and the Ribbono Shel Olam, then uh, Moshe Rabbeinu felt the need to defend us in that case? You mean to tell me since our sin was between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and it wasn't personally against Moshe Rabbeinu that he allowed himself to pray, to pray on behalf of the people, but in this case over here, because it was uh, personal, he chose not to daven for the people? I mean, does that make sense concerning a man like Moshe, who was exceedingly humble? It doesn't make such sense. So let's continue with Rabbeinu Bachia's words. How come he didn't try and persuade the rebels to do tshuva and to do the right thing? After all, Repentance can be done for anything and is very valuable in God's eyes. And there's no sin in the entire Torah, even the most grave and strictest of sins, that doesn't have the ability to be corrected through repentance. Anything and everything could be mended and repaired. As a matter of fact, Rabbi Nachman, Alava Shalom as well, teaches us that if you broke something, you have to believe that you can fix it as well. You don't just break something and walk away. Rabbi Nachman writes that you can't just destroy without knowing that you also have the ability to do a tikkun. In life, it can't just be one-sided. You can't have destruction without correction because you have the power to destroy you have that Bechira that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you but he also gave you the power to fix and everything and anything can be repaired and corrected says Rabbi Nachman but going back to Rabbi Nubachia's words listen to what he continues to say isn't God's hand outstretched to receive the ones who want to return from sin? 
even the rebellious ones and the wayward ones, the ones who sin against him. And if any of them, by the way, any of the, the ones from Korach, he said, the, the, the Korach and all of his uh, followers, even if any of them had a suffek concerning the appointments and the positions that Moshe Rabbeinu handed out, claiming that, ah, he just gave them out on his own without asking God for permission, Rabbeinu Bachir says that's not an issue. Haya efshar le Moshe la tetlahem ot, sheaminu bedvav. Moshe could have provided them with a heavenly sign so that they believe that what he's saying is true. Moshe could have said, Rabotai, I'm going to prove to you that I chose my brother Aharon as high priest, not because I wanted to choose him because he's my brother, so I, I felt as if he has uh, first dibs. No, I'm going to prove to you that it was God's word. So tomorrow, Tomorrow morning when you wake up, there's going to be a blanket of snow three inches tall on the desert sand. If Moshe would have provided them with a sign, they would have realized that indeed Moshe was simply following Hashem's instructions. So Rabbeinu Bachia wonders, why didn't Moshe offer them a siman, a sign, and then just be done with it? He says, after all, these men that we're talking about who rebelled against Moshe Rabbeinu were very intelligent and they were very wise. That sign would have given them the realization that Aharon was the Holy One who was chosen for the elevated task of priesthood. So why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu just give Korach v'chol adato a sign from the beginning instead of waiting until the very end? That's Rabbeinu Bachia's first question. The question is about Moshe Rabbeinu's reaction to Korach. In addition, assuming we consider Korach irredeemable, he's so far gone that there's no other choice but for the ground to open up and swallow him up. Sadly, you know, there are some people out there who truly are unfixable because of their uh, deep negative characteristic traits and their stubborn attitude. So even if we realize that Korach was so stubborn and he refused to repent and therefore the ground had to swallow him up with his entire entourage, uh, how could we explain the death of the babies and young children of of Korach and all of his followers who were swallowed into the ground as well. What did these children do? Asks Rabbeinu Bachya. Even if Korach and all of his chavr over there rebelled and sinned against God and his servant Moshe, and they were the ones, they were the cause for the punishment to come down upon them. What sin did the young children and babies who were in their cribs do? That they were counted among the ones who were punished. When did these young children sin? Vashem Tzadik, God is righteous. Lo ya'ase avla. He wouldn't bring about a punishment that wasn't deserved. There's no injustice in Hashem's realm. So Rabbeinu Bachya provides us here with strong arguments and because of that he concedes that if we're going to try to understand the story by just reading the pshat, reading the psukim as they are, we're not going to understand anything. He tells us that in this case over here, in this story, we have to explore the depths of Torah and its secrets in order to unravel this complex episode. Now, there's a few interesting things that we see in the parasha that will help us understand this story. First, Korach and his followers are referred to as Anshei Shem, renowned people, people with big names in the community, so, so to speak. They were Hashuvim. Now later on in the story, 
Moshe Rabbeinu tries to negotiate with Datan and Aviram who were in the process of joining Korach's rebellion. Now those negotiations never took place because Datan and Aviram refused to come to the table to discuss the matter so that they should arrive at a positive outcome. Moshe Rabbeinu tried to reach out to them, which Chachamim tell us, teaches us, that even when there's a very serious machloket, or where there's a very, very complex circumstance, you have to try to tend to it and deal with it through the lens of Torah, and to attempt to come to a peaceful resolution where both sides, not just one side, both sides are heard and both sides walk away satisfied. But we don't walk away without any form of discussion or resolve, assuming that we're right in our position and this is the way we're going to handle things, which is we're going to ignore, we're just going to walk away. We're not going to come to the table. We don't do that. Moshe Rabbeinu Allah Shalom is teaching us that even when someone comes at you with the greatest offense, you still have to try and reach out to create a proper and peaceful resolution for both parties involved. So Datan and Aviram never came to the table. Their answer to the conflict was, Lo na'ale, we're not going up. <laughs> Tell Moshe Rabbeinu, we're not interested, we know we're right, this is the way it has to be, there's no other way. Plus, plus, don't forget that we have 250 members of Sanhedrin who agree with us. They're on our side. So uh, to come to the table for us would be a waste of time because as far as we're concerned, we know that this is what the outcome should be. Plus we have Rabbanim backing us up. And then they have the audacity to say to Moshe Rabbeinu, meaning the message that they sent was, it's not enough that you brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the desert, but you also want to exercise authority over us? You haven't even brought us to the land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us the inheritance of fields and vineyards. And even if you gouge out the eyes of those men who are rebelling against you, we're not going to go up to speak with you. What does that mean? Even if you'll gouge out our eyes, we're not going to come to the table to speak with you? Who speaks like this? And if you don't want to come to the meeting that could resolve this entire mess, don't. Don't come. But why talk about the gouging of the eyes? Why are you being so extreme and so dramatic? Even if you gouge out our eyes, we're not coming. Wow, what is this? What Moshe Rabbeinu would really gouge out their eyes? Why are the Tan and Aviram using such a gory, horrific language over here? What are they talking about? We need to understand this. Plus, we need to explain the punishment itself, which was chosen by Moshe Rabbeinu. He sent a message to Datan and Naviram saying, Surna me'al ohalea anashim ma'reshaim ha'ele. Don't get involved in this awful machloket of these people here who are behaving like reshaim. Please get yourself away from the tents of these wicked people. Penti safu lechol chatotan lest you perish because of their sins, because you're being dragged into, ma into this machloket here. And the earth is going to open up its mouth. And it's going to swallow them and everything that's theirs. And they'll descend alive into the grave. And then you'll know that these men over here provoked God. Notice he says God and not him. So the punishment was death by the ground swallowing them up. So in order to understand this entire story, Rabbi Nubachia says that we have to travel back in time to the first time in history 
where we find a group of people who banded together and had a rebellious idea. You know, whenever something in life occurs, there's always an origin that's rooted not in the present. It's rooted in a past life, in something that precedes the present. So we're going to go back to Parashat Noah and to the following psukim in the Parashat, in, in Parashat Noah. Vayihi kol ha'aretz safa echat u'dvarim achadim and the entire earth was of one language and uniform words. Meaning everybody spoke the same language and Rashi HaKadosh Alava Shalom says that they were all united and they banded together with one scheme. What was the scheme? What did they say? They said Hashem has no right to select for himself the upper regions, the Elyonim. Let us ascend to the heavens and let's wage war against God. So this was the first group of people who came together to stage a rebellion against Hashem himself. They wanted to build a tower, Migdal Bavel, and their hope was to reach the heavens to send God a message that he should leave the inhabitants of this earth alone. Hashamayim shamayim la Hashem ve'ha'aretz natan livde adam. God, we don't want you involved in our dealings here on earth. The earth is our dominion as the heaven is your dominion. So please leave us alone. So they wanted to create a separation, a division between man and God, between heaven and earth. That's why they were called Do Hapalaga. What does Pilug mean? It means to split or to divide. What were they dividing? They were attempting to divide the heavens from the earth. They wanted to wage war against God in an attempt to push him away from this earth. So this group of rebels was the foundation of all groups of, level, of rebels that would band together someday in the future. So Korach's rebellion could be understood through the story of the Tower of Babel. So Parashat Korach and Parashat Noach are somehow connected. Now, these original rebels from Parashat Noach, they had to be stopped. How did Hashem stop their plan? Well, their plan was to build a, a tower, right? A big, a tall tower, and then also to construct a city. And for them, that was a very important thing to do because they said, they said, shem. Oh. They said, oh, and when we build this city and this tall tower, we're going to make a great name for ourselves. Very interesting. We'll make ourselves a shem. So the Mekubalim explain that when the Torah HaKadosha introduces Korach and his entire congregation of rebels and refers to them <coughs> as Anshei Shem, if you remember, that they were uh, uh, reputable people, it doesn't only mean that they were renowned men in their community. It means that they were literally Anshei Shem. These men were the Gilgulim, the reincarnations of the original Anshei Shem, the ones who rebelled against God in Doha Palaga and wanted to make a Shem a name for themselves. So Doha Palaga was the first sin of a group of rebels. That was strike one. So what was Hashem's solution to thwart these original rebels' plan? Well, uh, he created new languages and he put those languages in their mouths, 70 to be exact, which created mass confusion among them because nobody understand what his friend was saying. And that's one of the ways that he broke up that entire group of rebels. He created a division and a separation from one to the other by mixing up their languages as a midah keneged midah for them, for them wanting to cause a division between Hashem and the inhabitants of the earth. But we see that Hashem did not destroy them. He kind of gave them a suspended sentence. What happened after that? Fast forward to Parashat Vayera. 
where we're introduced to the evil city of Sedom. What does the Torah inform us concerning Anshei Sedom, about the people of Sedom? If you remember, Lot, Avraham Avinu, Alav Shalom's nephew, moved to Sedom after his shepherds and the shepherds of Avraham were in great conflict with one another. And of all cities that he could move to, of all places that he could choose to live, he chose a place filled with Tum'ah. But anyhow, in the merit of Avraham, his nephew Lot was going to be saved from the destruction of Sedom. The Malachim, if you remember, the angels were dispatched by Hashem to destroy Sedom and also to save Lot. And what does the Pasuk tell us? Listen to these words. Ve'anshei ha'ir, anshei Sedom, nasabu al habayit. And the people of the city, the people of Sedom, surrounded the house, Lot's house. They were there to, to protest. Everybody gathered around Lot's house, Mina'ar ve'ad zaken, both young and old. Kol ha'am mikatzeh, the entire populace of the city, from one corner of the city to the next, surrounded Lot's house. I want you to notice the wording of the Pasuk. Why does it read, Ve'anshei ha'ir, anshei zdom, and the people of the city, the people of zdom? It seems redundant. Why the double language? The Pasuk should have read, Ve'anshei Zdom and the people of Zdom. Why add the words, Ve'anshei Ha'ir and the people of the city? Well, if you remember what we learned about the Do Palaga, about the generation who built the Tower of Babel, what did they say? Remember their words? They said, Hava Nivnelanu Ir. Let's build for ourselves a city. Ah, oh, that's, that's very significant because the Mekubalim revealed to us that the Anshei Ha'ir are Anshei Zdom. The people who wanted to build that city and that tower in Parashat Noach came back as Gilgulim in Anshei Zdom, in the people of Zdom. So Hashem was offering the Anshei Ha'ir from the Doha Palaga the opportunity to rectify their grave mistake. So now we find a second case in Torah history where we have a group of people that gather together towards a common cause and that cause was not a good one. And their basic hashkafa is the world belongs to us. So well, we should have the right to, to do what we want to do, to be what we want to be, to uh, we, we, want, we want to send God away. And even although HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world as an olam chesed ibane, a world where people should engage in good deeds, these people over here stood in opposition to that idea of God. They said, we want to live the way we feel. For us, What's important is survival of the fittest. We want our independence. We want to be in charge of our own bodies and whatever action we take with it. Uh, you know the uh, slogan nowadays, uh, um, you, you, you do you, okay? So here we have another situation where they have a chance to rectify, but instead they gravitate to their former Gilgul. And the philosophy of Anshei Zdom, right, then reverts to the philosophy of Anshei Ha'ir, of the people from the Tower of Babel who felt that they have their own opinions about the way things should be and how the world should run. So the story of Sedom and the evil of their ways was strike two. And what happens over there? The mob outside Lot's home called out to him, saying, Where are those people, those visitors that came to your house? Don't you know that having guests is against the law in our city? Bring them out to us. We want to be intimate with them. Wow. They wanted to engage in an abominable sin. So Lot goes out to them. And he says, please don't do this evil. These rebel rousers are screaming and Lot is trying to defend the guests, the angels. 
you know, today we don't have the right to defend ourselves. We're supposed to allow others to destroy, to harm, and to kill because the protesting mob is given the rights, not us. But anyhow, what did the Malachim do at this point? They grab Lot, they pull him back into the house, and they close the door to save him from the, the protesting mob. They saved Lot from this mob who surrounded his house. And then the Psukim tell us, and those who were literally at the threshold of his door, he besanverim mikatan ve'adgadon. They smote them with blindness, both the young children and the, the adults. Once they were blind, obviously they couldn't find their way. It was hard for them to attack Lot. So later on in history, ladies, it makes sense that Datan and Aviram told Moshe Rabbeinu, even if you gouge out our eyes like it happened the last time around, we're still not coming to the table to discuss things with you. Datan and Aviram felt that blindness was something they experienced before this. So they said, even if we go through what we did in the previous Gilgul and our eyes are gouged out, Lona Ale. Wow, you gotta have some chutzpah, big chutzpah to say such a thing. But now we could understand why the people of Zdom Amora were punished more severely and why Hashem destroyed the entire city of Zdom. Because that was the second historical mob rebellion, so to speak. And that leads us to our parasha, which begins with the words, Vaikach Korach. And Korach took. He obviously took something. What did he take? How does the Targum Unkulos, Allah Shalom, explain the word Vaikach in this context? And he took. He writes, Vet peleg. Hmm, interesting. He says you should know that Korach is from Dor Hapalaga. Korach was a Gilgul. He was an old soul. All these men in our story here already been together in a previous lifetime in the generation of the Tower of Babel to rebel against the Rimono Olam, where they wanted their own independence and a life that did not include God. Then they came back again in the Anshe Ha'ir, Anshe Zdom. They were reincarnations of the people of Zdom, where there too they rebelled against God, creating a city that was the antithesis of godliness and morality. And now they came back again as Korach Va'adato. And Rabbi Nubachia continues to explain this episode. He reminds us that the Pasuk tells us that Korach and his entire entourage rose up before Moshe. Vayakumu lifnei Moshe. Now those words are very, very significant because what, what's really being told to us over here is that these people, Vayakumu, they already existed Lifnei Moshe, before Moshe's time. Vayakumu Lifnei Moshe, meaning they were from previous generations. And Rabbi Nubachia says, what can these, this be compared to? He says, to a merciful father who had a foolish son that wasn't behaving properly. The first time, the son, behaved ba the son behaved very badly, the father reprimands him. The second time he acts up, makeoto, the father hits him. But the third time he misbehaves, says Rabbeinu Bachia, mitya esh mimeno. He kind of gives up in despair. And he writes, this was the doha palaga. The sin they engaged in with the tower, that was their first sin. What did Hashem do? He kind of gave them a slap on the wrist, so to speak, by mixing up their languages. But when they came back as an Dom, and they repeated their offenses, they were stricken with blindness, and Hashem destroyed the city. But then when they came back in the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu, and they rebelled, three strikes and you're out. That was too much already. That was strike three, the game was over. 
they were buried alive in the ground and they're still there today in the bowels of the earth screaming in agony Moshe Torato emet Moshe and his Torah are indeed true and that was the reason why the children were punished as well because the children were also Gilgulim they had souls that never rectified from the previous generation so Moshe Rabbeinu came to the point where he felt that there could be no more patience allotted to people who simply don't want to change. They don't want to correct. They don't want to rectify. People who keep making the same mistakes in every generation that they're reincarnated in. And what did he feel would be the appropriate punishment this time around? The ground has to open and swallow them up alive. Why? Guess what? The answer lies in another story in Tanakh, in the, in the Torah, where the ground opened up to bury somebody. If we find that story, we might understand why Korach deserved this particular punishment. If you remember, when Bnei Israel left Egypt, they were Zaycha that the sea should part for them when Paro was chasing them with his army. Why was Am Yisrael Zaycha that the sea should split for them? Hayam ra'a vayanos. The sea saw and then it ran to the sides. It split. What did the sea see that it split? The Maharal, Alava Shalom, the Maharal of Prague writes that Bnei Israel are considered one body. They're one entity. When something happens to one Jew anywhere in the world, it affects all of us because we're considered one. Says the Maharal, the earth, the Aretz, is also considered one. One mass of land. The Gemara tells us, Sadna de Ara Chadhu. All seven continents on this earth are connected, meaning that the earth is one in its original makeup before HaKadosh Baruch Hu divided the lands. So really the Aretz is one like Klal Yisrael is one. But water, says the Maharal, is not one. Water, he says, is a combination of tipot, of drops of water, and it remains many tipot that are simply coming together. But it's not considered one entity like the Adama is. And he proves it because he asks, how do we say water in the plural form in Hebrew? Say maim. And he says, what about in the singular form? How do you say maim in the singular? It's also maim. In other words, there's no difference at the end of the day. It's always going to be maim in the plural because water is made up of many tipot and it remains that way. Maim is not considered one entity like the Adama. So since the Egyptians band together as a group to fight and destroy the Jewish people, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted dis to, to dismantle that Achdut because that kind of unity was for the sake of destruction. So the water, which is formed of droplets of water that come together, the water, like we said, isn't really one, drowned the Egyptians. Uh, let me explain, I'll explain it to you this way. B'nai Yisrael's tachlit, our purpose is achdut, is to be one. So when the water saw B'nai Yisrael, it couldn't bear to like hurt them in any way because the water represents the opposite of oneness of achdut it represents actually perud it symbolizes the multiplicity of its nature so when the sea saw the jews walking on the adama walking on the earth it's as if the water was saying we can't harm you because you represent the Adama, you represent the Aretz, which is formed from one entity, the Achdut, you are one. And even when the sea split, what does the Pasuk state? 
Even though they went into the sea, they were walking on dry land in the sea because that was the essence of Am Yisrael. Unity and oneness, just like the Aretz, the Adama is one. But when it came to the Egyptians, who came together as single individuals like the Tipot of Maim to form a group that would destroy, they weren't really one. They only came together in order to destroy and, they f and therefore they deserved to drown in those waters. And what is the Pasuk that we recite every day in the Az Yashir state concerning the Egyptians? Natita Yamincha God, you inclined your right hand. Tivla emo aretz. And the earth swallowed them up. Oh my God, now that's interesting. We always thought that Korach va'adato were the only ones who were swallowed up by the ground. But here we see that besides drowning in the sea, the Egyptians were swallowed up by the earth. Tivla emo aretz. Now, when Korach left Egypt with all of his brothers and sisters, at that time he was part of that one unit of the Takhlit of Achdut. So the water split for him just like it did for the rest of Am Yisrael. But once he left the Achdut, once he walked away from the unity of Am Yisrael and he formed his own group in rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu, which meant that Am Yisrael was now divided, the punishment for that would be Tivla Emu Aretz. The ground has to open up and swallow you because the Aretz represented the oneness and you deflected from that oneness, from the Achdut. You took these people who could have rectified from previous tikkun and you dragged them into your machloket. You band together like the Egyptians in order to create destruction. Your matara, your purpose was not to build, was not to make shalom. It was heres, it was to destroy. Therefore, just like the Egyptians, you too deserve to be swallowed up by the ground. But what happened? When Korach and all those who participated in his rebellion were swallowed up by the ground, what does the Pasuk say? Vatiftach ha'aretz et piha, and the earth beneath them opened its mouth. Vativla otam ve'et batehem, and it swallowed them and their houses. Ve'et kol ha'adam asher lekorach, and anybody who sided with Korach. Ve'et kol ha'rechush, and all of their property. Va'yerdu hem, ve'chol asher lahem, chayim she'ola. And they and all that they possessed descended alive into the grave. Vatechas alehem et ha'aretz, and the earth covered them up. Vayovdu mikol mitoch ha'kahal, and they were lost to the assembly. And then what? Chol Yisrael asher svivotehem, and all of the children of Israel who were around them, nasu lekolam fled to their cries, ki amru, because they said, pen tivla enu ha'aretz, maybe the earth is going to swallow us up too. And then what happened? A fire comes forth from the heavens and consumed these 250 members of Sanhedrin who joined Korach, sided with him, and advised him incorrectly. But, but what does it mean when the Pasuk says, nasu lekolam? They fled to their cries. The Jewish people heard the rumbling sound of the earth opening up, which is a massive, scary sound. They heard the screaming and the chaos of all those people who went down into the bowels of the earth together with all their belongings. So they ran away because they were afraid that the earth would swallow them up too. Now, if they're running away from this horrible sight, wouldn't it be more grammatically correct to say, Nas'u? Mikolam, they fled from their cries, not nasu lekolam. That sounds like they're kind of running towards the cries, not away from them. So Rashi explains that lekolam here means as a result of the cries. That makes sense. 
but the Oznaim la Torah, Lama Shalom writes that Nasu lekola means that the Jewish people actually did come closer in order to hear the outcry of Korach and his entire congregation. They heard screaming from underneath the ground and they were curious to hear what Korach and those who rebelled together with him were saying. They heard them all screaming, Moshe v'Torah to emet. But the word Nasu, which comes from the word Nas, sounds like they were running away. Like Hayam Ra'a v'Yanos. So it seems as if these two words are implying two different things. Nasu is running away and Lekolam is towards. How do you run away to? Don't you run from? And he points out that the Targum Yonatan ben Uziel Allah Shalom explains that the words Nasu means Hafchu, they turned around. So originally they were running away, but then they kind of turned around and went back to where the cries were coming from. And why did they turn around to go back? Obviously, because they hear sounds coming from the place where Korach and his followers were swallowed up, and they wanted to know what these Anshei Shem, what these important people who waged war against Moshe Rabbeinu, these people who were their leaders, their, their guides, what are they saying? Because what sin did they confess to if they really felt that what they did was correct and just? So when the Jewish people heard their leaders screaming, Moshe v'Torah to emet, they themselves did tshuva for having had any thoughts of doubt concerning Moshe Rabbeinu, even if they didn't join the rebellion. So Nasu Kolam means they actually turned around and walked back to hear what their leaders were confessing to so that they should know what rectification needs to be wrought on their part, even though they weren't part of the rebellion. That's one explanation. But there's an even deeper explanation. There were two people who miraculously survived the punishment of being swallowed up. Who were they? The two sons of Korach. Uvnei Korach Lometu. They didn't die. They did tshuva at the very last minute. The Midrash tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu formed a ledge for them that they used in order to climb out of the ground before the Adama closed in on them. And Baruch Hashem that they made it out because Shmuel Hanavi, the prophet Shmuel Alava Shalom, was a descendant of Korach's sons. Now if you remember, when Shmuel Hanavi's mother Hana was davening for a child because she was barren for many years, one of the things she said in her tefillah, very interestingly, is the following words. Morid she'ol vaya'al. Now simply speaking, she was saying that sometimes a person could descend to the abyss of difficulties, but then he could be raised from there. But the wording is interesting over here. Morid she'ol. Chachamim says she was referring to Korach, who descended to the Sheol, to the abyss, Ve'ya'al, and at least two of his sons survived. So she was saying, had Korach's sons not survived, I wouldn't be here. I, I'm, a, I'm a descendant of Korach's sons. So Chana was praising Hashem for the miracle that transpired with her ancestors, pointing out how important it is to do tshuva. A person can be in the Sheol, and if he does sincere tshuva, HaKadosh Baruch Hu could create miracles for him and he could ascend to spiritual heights. He could survive. As a matter of fact, the Gemara of Sanhedrin informs us, like I said, that a ledge formed in the bowels of Gehennam and the, the sons of Korach jumped onto that ledge and they began to compose a special shir, a song of repentance in honor of that episode that transpired. Now remember those people who ran back to the place where Korach was swallowed up? All of a sudden, they hear singing and they're wondering, where is the singing coming from? That's why the Pasuk states, Nas'u lekolam. They want to hear the song that emanated from the sons of Korach. How is the word kolam spelled? It's spelled kof, 
Vav, Lamed, Mem. Those letters actually form the acronym of the Pasuk. Uvenei Korach Lo Metu. Wow. Now in the Pasuk itself, the word is Lekolam. And Lekolam over here is written, by the way, without a Vav. And that's all right. That's all right. Because even if you write it without a Vav and you spell it Lamed Kuf Lamed Mem, without a Vav, it could also be read Lamnatseyach Livnei Korach Mizmor. Oh, <laughs> either way, we got it covered. I'm going to end with these words, with a question actually, is what schut did the sons of Korach have that they were the only ones who survived? Everybody else went down into the abyss. In what merit were they saved? And as we learned earlier, in order to arrive at such an answer, we have to go through Tanakh to see if there's anyone else in history who was swallowed up by the ground, but then saved. So let's go back to the generation of Sdom, where we see an amazing story. The Psukim in Bereshit inform us about the king of Shinar and three other kings on his side who waged war against Bera, the king of Sdom, and his allies, four kings. So it was the, the war of the four kings versus the five kings. And the location where they did battle was called Emek Hasidim, which was near the Dead Sea. Now very interestingly, we're told that this valley of Sidim was composed of be Be'erot Be'erot which Chachamim explain is like quicksand, a bunch of like different dunes of quicksand. And then the Pasuk tells us that Bera, the king of Sedom, as well as the king of Amorah, they ran away to this Emek Hasidim Vayeplu Shama. That's where they fell. Everybody else who survived fled to the mountains. But what happened over here? Rashi HaKadosh quotes the Midrash Rabbah Bereshit that tells us that the king of Sedom fell into this quicksand and he began to sink into the ground. Rashi says, A miracle was wrought for the king of Zdom that she should escape from sinking into the ground. Melech Zedom was the first person in history to be swallowed up by the ground and miraculously saved. Why was Izaicha to be saved? Rashi HaKadosh says that there were some nations who didn't believe that Avraham Avinu was miraculously saved from Ur Kazdim, from the fiery furnace that he was thrown into at the hands of Nimod. But, says Rashi, Kevan sheyatsa zem min homer, but since Melech Zdom, the king of Zdom, was saved from sinking into the ground, he'eminu be'avraham lemafreya. They believed that it happened to Avraham as well, retroactively. Many goyim thought that Avraham uh, back then by Ur Kazdim used some kind of magic trick, sorcery that enabled him to escape from the fiery furnace. But when the king of Saddam was saved from the quicksand, they realized, you know what? The miracles can happen. So Hashem created a miracle from Melech Zdom in order to verify the miracle that occurred for Avraham Avinu. But my question is, why would Hashem want to create a miracle for a Gentile who lived his life in the most abominable way? I mean, if you think about it, people could look upon this miracle and assume that miracles can happen to Rashaim, to, to evildoers. I mean, this miracle could make people assume that you don't have to be a tzaddik for miracles to occur on your behalf. So how do we understand this? Well, going back to the War of the Kings, if you remember, Lot was taken captive and Avraham tried to save him. And Rashid tells us that Avraham actually passed through this area where the quicksand was and he walks right past the king of Zdom as he's sinking into the abyss. And just as Avraham walked by, the miracle occurred for Melech Zdom. So Chachamim explained that it was actually in the merit of Avraham that Melech Zdom was saved. 
Avraham was the tzaddik who attracted miracles, dafka because of his righteousness. So the person who was saved in the zakhut of Avraham was someone who was part of Anshay's dom. And who did Anshay's dom eventually become? All those men who were involved in Korach's rebellion, right? So if Anshay's dom became the rebel rousers who rebelled against Moshe Rabbeinu, who should we assume Korach was? Korach was most likely a Gilgul of the king of Sedom. The fact that Korach was swallowed up by the ground was something that occurred once before. But Abraham felt that the king of Sodom has to be saved. He's got to be pulled out from the abyss that he was sinking into. Why? Because he didn't just see the king of Sodom sinking into the ground. He saw the future Gilgulim and future people of Am Yisrael that would come from Melech Sodom in the next reincarnation. He saw Shmuel Hanavi. He saw Hana. He saw the great Sadikim. So Abraham wanted someone to survive the sinking into the Adama so that there should be a future for Korach's sons who repented, that there should be a reality of Uvne Korach Lometu. So the fact that Korach's sons survived is in merit. You gotta go back to whom? To the times of Avraham Avinu. Remember that Perak of Tehilim? that we said was composed by Korach's sons, there's quite, quite a number of them, but this one in particular, Lam Natseach, Livnei Korach, Mizmo, remember that one? Wouldn't it be nice, very interesting, if there was some gratitude over there mentioned regarding Avraham Avinu in that Perek, Mem Zayin? I want you to look at the final Pasuk of that Perek. Listen to what it says. Nadivei Amim Esafu. The volunteers of the people have assembled. Am Eloke Avraham, the people of the God of Abraham, ki le'elokim magine eretz, for God has the shields of the earth. Me'od na'ala, he is exceedingly exalted. Wow. First of all, there's a reference to Avraham Avinu Bechlan in Sefer Tehilim. And here, over here in this Perik of Korach's sons, and there's a reference to him because he wasn't saving Melech Zdom. He was actually trying to save Bnei Korach, who were rooted in Melech Zdom, since, since the king of Zdom was going to come back as a reincarnation of their father who would bear them. And so Avraham has to be given thanks that in his merit, Korach eventually came back, right? You know what we learned from this story? How much one thing is connected to the next. How one person's life is intertwined with somebody else's. How if one piece of the puzzle is missing, you cannot understand the whole picture. And how every piece is important. We learn about how tikkunim and miracles are wrought in the world for the sake of our future. For the sake of our gilgulim, reincarnations. For the sake of our spiritual elevations. We learn about the chances that HaKadosh Baruch Hu offers us to correct former errors and how when we don't, grave consequences unfold. We learned about the power of tshuva and how even as we're sinking into the abyss, we could always ask Hashem to create a miracle for us so that we should ascend. We have the ability to come out of very dark places in the merit of tshuva. That the lessons of the parasha should be remembered in your mind so that you proceed forward into your life, understanding how important your spiritual success is. May you be zeichet to always attach yourself to people who will lead you on a path of true righteousness and shalom. And be'ezrat Hashem, we should merit to complete our tikkun in this world, here and now, in our present Gilgul, and become one with ourselves and with Hashem. Amen, Ken. You hear what's on.